Thank you. The next item of business today is a stage three debate on motion 17645 in the name of Fiona Hislop on the Census Amendment Scotland Bill. Now, before the debate begins, um, the presiding officer has to make a determination on whether or not any provision of this bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral system or the franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. And in the case of this bill, in my view, it does no such thing. Therefore, it does not require a supermajority at stage three. So can I invite all members who wish to speak in this bill to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Fiona Hislop, to speak to and move the motion. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am very pleased to open this stage three debate on the Census Amendment Scotland Bill. The deliberations of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee through stages one and two have been considered. Uh, whilst the bill may not have been extensive in terms of its size, it certainly is very important for Scotland's 2021 census. And this has been demonstrated by the evidence provided by stakeholders. I would like to reiterate my gratitude to everyone that has contributed to the census bill process. I'd also like to take this opportunity again to highlight why it is important to support Scotland's census, which includes this bill. Scotland's next census will be held on Sunday the 21st of March 2021, subject to the approval of the Scottish Parliament. This will be the 22nd census to take place since 1801 and the 17th to be managed independently here in Scotland. It is the first census since the Scottish Government pledged to make public services digital first. We are building a platform to enable people to complete online and we expect the majority of responses to be online but with support available for those who need it. Scotland has relied on the information the census gives us for over 200 years and it remains the best way to gather the information government, councils, the National Health Service and others need. The information we will gather from the census helps us to understand who lives in Scotland and what sort of homes we have. It is the official count of every person and household in the country and the only questionnaire of its kind to ask everyone the same questions at the same time. No other survey provides the richness and range of information that the census does. The Scottish Government and other public bodies use census information to help make decisions, including how money will be spent on the schools where our children are educated, the roads we drive on every day, and the hospitals we, we rely on. The key quality aspects of census data are that it has to be able to count the whole in, uh, population, it has to be credible, people have to have confidence in it, and it needs to be consistent with other comparators. We are very proud of the richness of data that we hold and the consistency of approach that we can demonstrate over these 200 years. National Records of Scotland has responsibility for Scotland Census on behalf of the Registrar General for Scotland. Work is well underway to ensure the 2021 Census is secure and privacy is protected with Census records held securely and confidentially for 100 years. The Census uh, tells us who we are how we live and work in Scotland. And in telling that story, it must reflect society. It's not a vehicle to lead change in society. National Records of Scotland have consulted extensively with groups all over Scotland to de develop proposed questions and test these questions to ensure that they are acceptable to the public. <coughs> By asking questions which reflect Scotland as it is today, we will ensure the census will continue to be a vital source of information for decades to come. The final decision about what questions are asked in 2021 will be for the Scottish Parliament. Collecting census information is a substantial undertaking as it is, is, producing, outputs from that, uh, as is it producing outputs from that information. It takes a considerable amount of time in order to ensure that they are complete and are of the quality required by national statistics. National Records of Scotland will be carrying out a thorough process of capturing, coding and cleaning the data and then ensuring it is complete. They then apply rigorous controls to the data to, in order to ensure that we protect the confidentiality of the data and deliver on the legal commitments which have been made. This takes time, but it is essential to ensure the robust data that is used from across services in Scotland. National Records of Scotland has already announced their intention to publish the first set of estimates from the 2021 census within a year of census day, which will be considerably earlier than in 2011. Indeed. Amy Green. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking my intervention. Uh, could the Cabinet Secretary explain uh, what the public consultation process or what engagement 
uh, uh, members of the public will have in forming these new questions and testing and stress testing these new questions. Cabinet Secretary. Well, there are two elements. Can I, can I say in terms of the consultation, particularly for users, because it is about the use and the need for the population, uh, this actually commences uh, years and years ago. This is not something that happens now. This is something that's developed over a considerable amount of time, as is the stress testing. So there are different types of that. Is the actual questions itself. There are different sections in re relation to different uh, communities, but also in terms of Gaelic, for example. Uh, and that has been taking place over uh, recent years and indeed in, in latter stages, even in recent re weeks and months. So as part of the members membership of the, uh, the Culture Committee, uh, I, I have encouraged my officials and the, from the National Records of Scotland to keep it, the committee abreast of all the process and progress of, of the census because uh, officer, I'm about to move on to the particular content of this bill, but actually the whole census project is far wider and deeper. And in terms of that stress testing, and obviously the member will be aware the fact that it's digital will also have an implication in terms of that stress testing as well. That is a new dynamic to this census than in previous years. Um, all remaining outputs uh, should be published over the course of the following two years. Um, and then including those on sexual orientation and transgender status and history in terms of the output from the census within that first year of census day in the following two years will also include the references to sexual orientation and transgender status which is the subject of this bill. So it is essential we have quality data and must use the required time to achieve that. The Census Bill is an important part of that. I'm sure that everyone knows the purpose of the bill is to amend the 1920 Census Act to allow questions on sexual orientation and transgender status and history to be asked on a voluntary basis. It is widely recognised that there is limited evidence on the experiences of transgender people in Scotland with currently no fully tested question with which to collect information. Therefore, the census will be taking a big step forward to ensure that we can develop the evidence needed to provide support and protection for Scotland's transgender population. Sexual orientation is already asked in most household surveys in Scotland, and it is proposed that the sexual orientation question for the 2021 census would mirror the question already used in these other surveys and elsewhere in the UK. Society has changed significantly and rapidly in the 10 years since the last census, so we must ensure the census in 2021 reflects that. The need for collecting this information has been arrived at through a process of consultation and research, as I've just reported in my response to Jamie Green. National Records of Scotland has worked and continues to work with stakeholders to understand the needs and concerns of the communities involved. The power to ask these questions on a compulsory basis already exists in the Census Act 1920, but refusing to answer a census question or neglecting to do so is an offence under the Section 8 of the Census Act 1920. And we want to ensure that non-completion of voluntary questions will not result in the penalties that exist for non-compliance in respect of mandatory questions. It is critical uh, that nobody is or feels in any way compelled to answer these important but sensitive questions. Therefore, the bill seeks to mitigate any concerns about intrusion into private life by placing these questions on a voluntary basis, as was the case with religion when it was included for the first time in the 2001 census. I was pleased that the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee supported the general principles of the bill in its stage one report and likewise by parliamentary colleagues at the stage one debate on the 20th of February. In my stage one response to the committee in Parliament, I committed to bring forward amendments at stage two to address the issue of the perceived conflation of sex and gender identity in the bill as introduced. I delivered on that commitment and I'm glad to say that the committee accepted these amendments. National Records of Scotland uh, worked with Equality Network and others on the specific text of these amendments before they were lodged. This included consulting with other interested stakeholders, including the women's groups that responded to the committee's call for evidence at stage one to highlight the suggested amendments and to seek any views they had on them. I am pleased to say that only support was received. The amendments placed transgender status and history into Schedule 1 of the Census Act 1920 as an entry on its own alongside religion and sexual orientation and removed the provision in the bill which would have been added, I quote, including gender identity to the paragraph in that schedule which contains the word sex. The amendments ensure that the census order will be avail available to make the question on transgender status and history voluntary, which is one of the key purposes of the bill. 
The presiding officer, the Census Bill will allow questions on sexual orientation and transgender status and history to be voluntary. However, there is still a subordinate legislative process to follow to ensure these questions are included in our 2021 Census, and that process will very soon be underway. I'm grateful for the support of Parliament up to this point and look forward to the further and extensive engagement that lies ahead. And I move that the Parliament agrees that the Census Amendment Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Jamie Green to open for the Conservative Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank uh, fellow members of the committee and the staff uh, who work with our committee on uh, getting this uh, bill to where it is. I mean, the reality is that never before, at least since I joined this parliament, has a one-page uh, bill, 23 lines of it, caused so much debate, uh, discourse, uh, attracted correspondence, and indeed controversy. Um, but before I get on to those uh, complex issues around sexuality, sex, transgender identity, let's start with the basics. What is a census and what is it for? Uh, a definition of a census is the procedure of systematically acquiring and recording information about the members of a given population. We can thank the Romans for this. What have they ever done for us? Um, but as we know, the census is important for many reasons in the modern age. Uh, completed every 10 years, the next one will be in March 2021. It gives us a complete picture of the nation and gives uh, the sort of information that governments need to develop policy, to plan uh, services, and how it's going to allocate funding to those services. And now, the last census was altered. Uh, it's not unusual to alter census. In 2011, th there were additional questions added around race. They, too, were voluntary changes. So the census changes. Society changes. Governments change. And attitudes, hopefully, change as well. The purpose of this bill is simple. It will allow the National Records of Scotland to alter the census and vary the questions it asks. It proposes to add, add two additional voluntary questions. One, around transgender status and history, and two, sexual orientation. We do not know what those questions will be, nor the guidance that goes around them, but we will uh, address that when we have to. They will be voluntary, not mandatory questions. They will not force people to answer them. There is no penalty for not answering them. By answering these questions, they will not redefine one's sex, nor will they change it legally. They will not infer additional rights or freedoms on anyone, but nor will they remove anyone's existing rights or freedoms. Now, the stage one report uh, came to a recommendation uh, that the current mandatory sex question in the census remains a binary option. Um, I, uh, alongside another member, abstained from this recommendation, not because I took a view on it during the discourse of uh, the stage one report, but because in my view, that was not what this bill was about, or nor was what the bill was proposing. That was not the question either that the committee was asked to respond to. Now the committee had a point to make with that recommendation and it made its point, but the debate around the conflation of the term sex, gender, and gender identity is a complex one. It might strike an observer slightly odd as why there's been so much fuss around a simple uh, bill and so much debate has come out of this. And I have a thought on this, and I think it comes down to one thing, and that's the timing of it. Because as many of you are aware, there's a wider conversation taking place around gender recognition legislation, the content of which we are yet to see. And this whole subject does inevitably stir up emotions. Uh, I see this bill as being somewhat of a precursor of that debate, of what I think will be a wide-ranging debate. But let me bring back to the real question of why we need this data, who needs it, and what we're going to do with it. One MSP commented to me in the early days of this that he said it was none of government's business uh, to ask these questions. And to an extent, to be fair, I have some sympathy with the notion of minimal government interference in people's private lives. But I do think these are useful additions to the census. I will be happy to answer one of these voluntary questions, albeit digitally. And it is interesting that when the ONS looked at this legislation in England and Wales, they actually said that the inclusion of a prefer not to say option might improve the response rates. So we shall see what questions are put before us. There is a shortage of meaningful data when it comes to information about the LGBT community in Scotland. Our public services need this data to identify uh, how it will make funding decisions, how it will deliver 
service plans across health, education and social care, all areas that we frequently hear are under-delivering under this community. As co-convener of this Parliament's LGBTI cross-party group, much of the research that I'm presented with comes from the third sector, from organisations like Stonewall and Youth Scotland. I think robust national data would allow public bodies to make better decisions. And this is important because we know from research that LGBT young people in Scotland experience higher levels of mental health problems. We know that nearly half of LGBT young people ex uh, rate their school experience as bad. Uh, we know that uh, equally a quarter of LGBT people are facing issues in their place of employment. So this data will help government make decisions around that. After this bill passes, we as a parliament have two tasks ahead of us. The first, the NRS will present us with the new voluntary questions for our approval. And I think it's absolutely right that the questions are the right ones, that they make sense, and that they're accompanied by appropriate guidance on how to answer them. Because somebody who identified themselves in the old census using the sex question may now use these new voluntary questions as a means of doing so. But we have to ensure that there are high levels of data returned and that the quality of that data is reliable. So the devil will very much be in the detail. The second, most importantly in closing, uh, task ahead of us is the more difficult debate around gender recognition. And all I'm going to say on this matter for now, because it's not a debate for today, is please, please let everyone's voice be heard in this debate. And let us collectively as a parliament condemn threatening or abusive behaviour wherever it appears from whomever it comes from. If we're going to get this right, and we must get it right, then we must lead by example. I'll do my bit. I hope we all will. Thank you very much. And I now call on Claire Baker to open for the Labour Party. Um, thank you, President Officer. I am pleased that today we are debating stage three of the Census Amendment Scotland Act as part of the preparations for the 2021 Census. As well as opening this debate for Labour, as a member of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee, I would like to thank everyone who provided evidence to the bill stages and those who have provided briefings for today's debate. At the stage one debate, I highlighted a number of drafting issues with the bill, and I am pleased that these were addressed by amendments at stage two. I believe that we now have an important bill in the evolution of the census, which recognises the need for relevance by introducing questions on sexual orientation and transgender status and history in an appropriate manner. But it has not been a smooth journey. The progress of the bill takes place against the backdrop of anticipated changes to the Gender Recognition Act. At times, this debate is too divisive, aggressive and intolerant of alternative views. There will be time for parliamentary scrutiny and debate, and it is our duty to approach that in an inclusive and responsible manner. Returning to today's bill and the census, the bill suggested a conflation of sex and gender, which appeared to preempt the decision about any proposed changes to the sex question. The guidance provided with the bill added to these concerns. The policy memorandum to the bill said, Looking forward to 2021, consultation has identified the need for a more inclusive approach to measuring sex. The sex question being proposed for the 2021 census will continue to be one of self-identification and will provide non-binary response options. The national records provided additional written evidence to the committee later, which said, we are currently considering whether or not to have a non-binary response option for the sex question but it's too early to see if this will be the final proposal as testing and consultation continues. This position was then confirmed by the Cabinet Secretary during her evidence. So this lack of clarity was unfortunate in our scrutiny of the bill. It resulted in the committee taking considerable evidence on this issue, even though it's not the subject of the piece of the legislation. There are, however, important matters raised which should inform the national records for Scotland and how to take forward the next stages of the census. Firstly, there are questions to be addressed about the changes which were made to the guidance provided for the census in 2011, which made it clear that trans people should answer with their self-identified sex. It is important to recognise that this is a mandatory question and answering the sex question was difficult for transgender people and answering the question with their lived identity is consistent with how they present in other areas of their lives. However, there are arguments that this has introduced a degree of uncertainty into the data gathered and that this has now means that sex and gender identity are conflated into one question. 
There is a proposal that we heard through the committee process that there should be two questions, one on sex and one on gender identity. I do understand the concerns raised by the Equality Network that to reverse the position of 2011 would be highly problematic. Transgender people have existing legal rights to privacy, dignity and respect, and they argue it's not appropriate to insist people disclose their biological sex at birth. Murray Blackburn Mackenzie argued that this approach damages data integrity and quality and that it sets a precedence for other data gathering exercises and surveys, resulting in the loss of robust data on the protected characteristic of sex. So how do we resolve a situation which has already been created? We can reflect that there should have been some discussion and scrutiny prior to 2011 and learn from that experience. But I would hesitate towards reversing that decision. This bill, by including questions on trans status and history, should enable policymakers and anyone else interested in the data to cross-reference responses and extrapolate figures based on sex and on gender identity. At the next stages of the census process, I would look for reassurances on this. Secondly, the committee, by a majority, voted to remain, retain a binary sex question. Although I did abstain on this vote, given that the issue was not the focus of our work at hand, a majority of committee members were persuaded by evidence we heard from experts who used the information gathered from the census. I raised an issue around this at stage two, which the Cabinet Secretary may wish to respond to. I understand that for a non-binary person, the choice they are presented with does not reflect their lived experience. However, the NRS said that they would then just assign a sex to the respondent. In committee, they said, if we ask a non-binary question, that is a big if and is obviously something for the committee to take a view on. We do not propose to produce outputs on a non-binary basis. In our conversation with stakeholders, we've always been consistent. It's about allowing people to respond in a way that reflects how they identify and that we will still produce outputs on a male and female basis. I would welcome clarity on what purpose a change to the binary question would serve. The response from the national records also makes assumptions about the number of people who would choose a non-binary term. I appreciate the, na the national records will undertake testing of the questions, but how many people and how they will respond to the question is unknown. Could the Cabinet Secretary perhaps respond to these issues in her closing remarks? Thank you, President Officer, and I look forward to this afternoon's debate. Thank you very much. And I call Ross Greer to open for the Green Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, given the volume of amendments to some other recent pieces of legislation, it's been a while since we've reached the stage three stage of a debate in here and been in the position of seeing essentially the same discussions that we were having at stage one. But despite the much wider debate, which specific census questions play into, this bill itself is not a contentious one. It's short. It's really quite simple and it's something the Greens support, both from the point of view of effective data collection and the improvements it makes in ensuring that this is a country where everyone is treated with dignity and respect by the state. The bill's purpose is to ensure that everyone feels able to accurately complete the census, a principle which does find consensus here in Parliament. It will allow questions in future editions of the census regarding sexuality and what we're now referring to as trans status or history to be asked appropriately, namely as voluntary rather than mandatory questions. Compelling someone to answer something as intensely personal as their sexuality or trans status would be wrong. It would be wrong even if we lived in a society that was free from bigotry. But clearly we don't, as was brutally illustrated by the monstrous attack on two queer women on a London night bus just last week. And in the stories told by members of the trans community outside this parliament just a few hours ago, at the same time, though, the opportunity to collect this data from those happy to provide it is an opportunity to meet the needs of those who too often go unnoticed and unsupported. It's a small change to something that happens once a decade, but it's part of a process to ensure people's identities are respected, particularly when they engage with public services. The committee in our stage one deliberations received submissions in support of the bill and of trans inclusion more broadly from many national and long-standing equality organisations including the Scottish Trans Alliance, Stonewall Scotland, and Gender, Rape Crisis Scotland, Scottish Women's Aid, Close the Gap, and Equate Scotland. I'd like to thank the Equality Network in particular for their evidence, for their helpful suggestion of an amendment which the committee agreed with and the government delivered on, and for their work today, organising the powerful rally outside of Parliament, where the voices of trans people and their supporters across this Parliament were heard. As I mentioned in the stage one debate though, I'm not the only one to have been frustrated and saddened by the process surrounding this bill and our committee considerations of it. 
I acknowledge that the national records ask the committee to consider the potential questions which will come through the census order after this bill is passed. But we should acknowledge the upset and anxiety that's been caused to many vulnerable people by the digression of this debate into matters out with the scope of the bill. At times, the very validity and existence of trans and non-binary people was called into question. I do feel some shame that my parliament has caused some of my friends this stress and a fear that their rights, rather than being enhanced, could be rolled back. What should have been a small technical amendment to the Census Act to ensure appropriate wording has become an avenue through which a major debate has played out. And frankly, I don't think it's played out in a way that any of us can be happy with. We can do better than the false framing of trans rights versus women's rights, as all of Scotland's leading women's organisations have so ably shown us. And when the Gender Recognition Act comes before us, I hope and expect that we will do better than hear evidence from just a single trans person. I certainly hope that those women's organisations like Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland will in future be invited to present their wealth of evidence and experience showing that their trans inclusion measures have not undermined the rights of cisgender women. Legitimate concerns were raised through this bill though and should be addressed in the broader debate on the introduction of trans inclusion measures. How trans inclusion measures intersect with services for women including women's only spaces is one example. As Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland highlighted in their written evidence, once it became clear that this is where the debate had turned, their experience providing support services for women who have experienced violence in a trans-inclusive manner has given them rich evidence. Their letter to the committee stated that it is very clear to us that trans-inclusion in our own organisations has not given rise to substantive concerns or challenges. Rather, trans women have added to our movements through their support, voluntary work and as staff members." End quote. Some questions raised were very much within scope, of course, particularly around data reliability and comparability. It was suggested that questions completed on the basis of self-ID, which is existing practice, and the inclusion of a third option in the sex question would harm the overall data set and in turn affect, for example, planning of sex-based services. I believe that fears here are misplaced and I would point in particular to the submission from the Head of Engagement for NHS National Services, the body overseeing the patient information database. The NHS uses its own data rather than the census in service planning and they already collect patient data on the basis of self-ID without issue. The Coalition of National Women's Organisations have extensive experience with this type of data also stated that collecting this information in a trans-inclusive fashion would be beneficial. Now, I dissented from the committee's stage one conclusion in favour of a binary sex question. Like the respected women's and equalities organisations mentioned, I support a third option. Its inclusion allows more people to complete the census. As the National Records of Scotland found, it increases response rates despite the uh, conclusion in the committee's stage one report claiming the contrary. It could allow us to gather valuable data on a small and vulnerable group for whom we cannot practically gather that information any other way and it doesn't negatively affect anyone else. Yes. Claire Baker. Thank you. Um, I don't know if Mr Clear noticed that in the evidence we received, the national record said that if there was a third option, they would just assign a sex, male or female. It seems like they wouldn't actually gather any data on a group that presented as non-binary. Ross Clear. I, I thank the member for that intervention. That's why I said it could allow us to collect that valuable data, that's a choice to be made. It's a policy choice for the National Records of Scotland or for the Scottish Government. It's a choice this Parliament can have a decision on about whether to reallocate the people whose data is collected in that group between the male and female categories. But the point is that collection of the data doesn't negatively affect anyone else. Indeed, for all other purposes, as the members mentioned, that random redistribution into male and female categories will happen. So my question remains, why not make a change which positively benefits a small and vulnerable group at no cost? But I would also like to ask the Cabinet Secretary, perhaps if she could reflect on this uh, in her closing remarks, as Claire Baker has already asked, about the uh, sex question as it stands, if it were to have a binary option or not, will it continue to be on the basis of lived sex as it has been previously? I hope that as this process moves forward, all members take the opportunity to listen to those whose lives and identities we are discussing. A role of this parliament is to lift up the voices of Scotland's most marginalised. The census bill is only one small opportunity to do just that, which is why I support this bill. Thank you very much. And now call on Tavish Scott to open for the Liberal Democrats. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this is, uh, as others have observantly noted, a somewhat short uh, bill, three sections only. And I'm more confident than usual, or indeed anyone could be more confident than usual, that everyone in this debate will genuinely have read the whole thing, not something we could probably argue about a planning bill next week. 
Uh, possibly. Uh, but uh, its brevity doesn't translate into a lack of importance, as the Cabinet Secretary correctly observed. Getting the census right uh, is a once-in-a-decade task that is laid before uh, the Parliament at that time. And just as with the census before, the results of this uh, will be then reflected on for many decades to come. But before I deal with a couple of points in the bill itself, I want to associate myself with the motion recently tabled and widely supported across this Parliament. As Jamie Green and Ross Greer have reflected, one issue has hit the headlines or at least been a feature of um, some social media traffic. And that is the importance of the census producing accurate information about sex and gender identity as a precursor to the wider legislative proposals that this Parliament will consider on these matters in due course. This place, this uh, national parliament, above all, should not tolerate threats, intimidation and physical violence against women who articulate a view on the definitions of sex and gender. We must surely make a joint, concerted and strong stand against what happened at Edinburgh University recently, as Jenny Mara's motion rightly does. As someone involved in the university debate put it to me, the whole situation is distressing and most distressing of all is the sense that those of us arguing for a rational debate that allows arguments against simply replacing sex with gender identity across law and public policy to be properly heard are being left vulnerable to defamation and threats of violence. Presiding officer, any sympathy I have for an argument evaporates when some of those, some of those who purport to make that behave in the way in which I now understand happen. We cannot and should not tolerate that. It's not the Scotland I want, and it's not the Scotland this Parliament surely wants uh, either. A rational debate about rights needs to be just that, rational. <laughs> Uh, so I, think also, I think it's important to be clear on what we are talking about here today. In passing this bill, the census will be equipped to gather more data about people's gender identification and their sexual orientation. Of course, the actual questions which will be asked in the 2021 census will be considered via secondary legislation in the form of a census order. No doubt there will be further important debates about uh, around exactly how those questions are worded uh, and those will be for later. But during the course of this debate, I've certainly listened to those who have argued and about how we shape this bill in order to get the census right. I think important arguments have been made about the importance of robust data, and it is important to reflect on the policy memorandum, which does explain that government, local authorities, health services, the education and academic communities, the third sector, commercial businesses and others need reliable information on the number and characteristics of people and households if they are to conduct many of their activities effectively. That seemed to me to be the uh, overwhelming weight of the evidence that I and many committee colleagues heard in recent uh, weeks. Ensuring that those services are equipped with robust data to carry out their services is therefore the overwhelming purpose of this census. Now, there have been important reflections during the course of this debate already about how we ensure that, debater, that data rather is robust, and Ross Greer has uh, absolutely added to his perspective on that matter. I also recognise the arguments that have been made about the importance of representation. The census will collect information that will be relied on. It is uh, therefore important that the snapshot that will be taken at this time is able to accurately reflect Scottish society as it is at this time. Society uh, not just includes the trans community in the census, mm -hmm. and that community, sorry, the, the trans community are not, uh, need to be included in that uh, census. That community deserves to be seen uh, not just uh, in the census, but to be counted accurately in that census as it is uh, taken forward. These are the first steps to, having, to people having their rights realised, whoever they are, right across Scotland and in whatever way. Our records don't know enough about the trans community, and with the passing of this bill and other bills that will come, that will surely change and change for the better. Presiding officer, I believe this bill is capable of doing what it is set out to do. It is surely to design a census that collects important social demographic information that is used in the design and delivery of public services. And on that principle, we on these benches will very much support this measure. Thank you very much. We now turn to the open part of the debate. I call Joan McAlpine to be followed by Annie Wells. Joan McAlpine. Thank you very much. And before I start, I'd like to associate myself with the remarks of uh, Claire Baker, Jamie Green and Tavi Scott in uh, urging a civilised debate on these matters and condemning all violence or threats of violence against women as outlined in Jenny Mara's motion to the Parliament. I'd also like to thank uh, the committee clerks and all the witnesses who gave evidence uh, to our scrutiny of this bill. 
I support this bill. Both sexual orientation and gender reassignment are protected characteristics under the Equality Act 2010, and it's appropriate to ask about them in the census on a voluntary basis. Sexual orientation should be simple to quantify and produce data useful to our understanding of society. Trans status is more complex, as well as transsexuals who have surgery after psychological therapy. Stonewall's trans umbrella includes people with no medical treatment who refute the contention that they have a psychological condition, and it includes transvestites and non-binary identities. And it will be interesting to see how the census question captures meaningful information about this very different group of individuals. I wanted to explain briefly why some feminists uh, find the concept of gender identity problematic. In her book, The Second Sex, the philosopher Simone de Beauvoir argued gender was a social construct, not something innate. Some so-called feminine characteristics, such as passivity, concern for appearance and types of dress, are roles we adopt, not who we are. Feminists believe that a boy can like pink and play with dolls and he's still a boy, and a girl can like toy trucks and crop her hair and she's still a girl. To suggest that those who do not conform to these gender stereotypes must be a different sex uh, is troubling for some feminists. So I reject the concept of innate gender identity, but I will vote for the bill in the spirit of pragmatism and compromise because I accept that for a growing number of people, identity is of deep personal significance. Sex is also a protected characteristic in the Equality Act and a census question for 200 years. It's particularly important for women that sex is recorded accurately because it is women who face most discrimination based on their sex. We also need to record sex to plan services such as health. The book Invisible Woman by Caroline Criado Perez, a favourite of the First Minister, demonstrates that bodies don't just differ in terms of reproduction syst reproductive systems, but also in many other ways, for example, the presentation of heart disease. The proposed non-binary sex question was rejected by the majority of the committee and, crucially, by the Office for National Statistics, ONS. ONS conducted a robust equality impact assessment on the census, whereas the same exercise by NRS in Scotland was inadequate. It did not consider sex as a separate characteristic, for example. The sex question should also be based on biological sex, in my view. In 2011, without any public scrutiny, the census had online guidance saying that the sex question could, for the first time, be answered according to how people felt. The briefing from Murray Blackburn Mackenzie points out that that decision was based on a flawed private consultant's report that erroneously said sex included gender reassignment. They also point out that as we have no idea how many trans-identifying people, including non-binary, live in Scotland, no amount of testing by NRS can tell us how the data might be affected in 2021 by a self-identifying sex question. Professor Susan McVeigh, cha Chair of Quantitative Criminology at the University of Edinburgh, who sits on the government's Board of Official Statistics, told the committee the self-identified question in 21 was a mistake. In a further letter this week, she says the conflation of sex and gender identity goes against equalities legislation and risks the construction of inaccurate and corrupted data. The inclusion of a trans question for the first time means that people can express their identity and answer the sex question accurately. I am not convinced by briefings that refer to lived sex. There is no definition of lived sex in either law or biology. It's been suggested that feelings may be hurt if transgender people have to answer a question on biological sex. But there are other census questions which people could find distressing, such as on mental health and disability. They answer them knowing that the census remains confidential for 100 years. And trans people will, of course, on other occasions, have to reference their birth sex, not least in regards to medical treatment. So in conclusion, I hope the Cabinet Secretary take my points on board, and more importantly, the expertise of Professor McVeigh, Murray Blackburn Mackenzie, and the Office of National Statistics. The census is the gold standard of statistics, and it's important that it's committed to both accuracy and material reality. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to call Annie Wells to be followed by Stuart McMillan. I would encourage members to try and keep to four minutes if they can. Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and to all the organisations that kindly sent briefings ahead of this debate. It's only right that the census reflects the views of modern day society, which is why I will be supporting this bill at stage three today. 
Things have moved forward since stage one, and I am pleased to see that during stage two, clarity has been provided on how questions on sexual orientation and gender identity will be formatted. I also welcome further engagement regarding the wording of such questions and that the Parliament will have the opportunity to consider future questions once finalised. The census is no insignificant task. Completed every 10 years and the next one scheduled for March 2021, it gives us a complete picture of the nation, providing information needed by governments in the UK to develop policy, plan and run public services and allocate funding. And with regards to equality data, it provides an opportunity to build on existing data so that public authorities can fulfil the public sector equality duty and consider the full needs of protected groups under the Equality Act. Times have moved on. More and more people are openly identifying as LGBT and it's only right that the census reflects that. The bill will allow National Records of Scotland to alter the current census to vary the questions to vary the questions asked, resulting in the inclusion of questions on prescribed aspects of gender identity and sexual orientation. It does, of course, go without saying that this all needs to be done with care and consideration. The purpose of the census, after all, is to collect data that is accurate and reliable. Questions should be clear and straightforward, and given the need for individuals' privacy, they should only be answered on a voluntary basis without the threat of penalty. We have to understand that not everyone will feel comfortable providing this information and that in homes where the form is being completed by the head of the household, young people in particular may not want to disclose their sexual orientation or gender identity. I'm therefore pleased that these questions will be voluntary and that National Records of Scotland has committed to ensuring that individuals can submit a private response to the census, replacing any response submitted on their behalf. I'm also pleased that at stage two, the Cabinet Secretary altered the bill to place trans status in history as an entry on their own alongside religion and sexual orientation, removing concerns about the perceived conflation of gender and sex. It is reassuring to see the National Records of Scotland worked with the Equality Network and others on the specific text of the amendments before they were lodged and that no issues were raised with stakeholders, including women's groups that provided evidence at stage one. Significantly, it is also welcome that given the actual inclusion or wording of any such question is not within the scope of this bill, this will be subject to further engagement with National Records of Scotland and stakeholders. I'm also reassured by the fact that the Scottish Parliament will have the right to consider and reject a future question should it see fit, meaning that all evidence can again be duly considered. Presiding officer, I would like to reiterate my support for the bill at stage three. This is a short but much needed bill that will allow the census to reflect modern day society. By passing this bill, we can hopefully build an existing equality data and assist public authorities in fulfilling the needs of protected groups. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you very much, Planning Officer. Planning Officer, this bill, which is, a large, which is largely technical in nature, it has caused a stir in terms of some of the public debate, but the bill simply seeks to amend the enabling powers of the 1920 Act. And it has, as has been stated before by, uh, by the Cabinet Secretary, a period of informal engagement with the committee uh, regarding the questions will begin after this stage three process. And my focus today is solely on the contents of the bill and what that's intended to do. But I will touch upon one other aspect uh, shortly. But I welcome the passage of the bill uh, through Parliament and I recognise how important it is to actually keep the census up to date with society. And during the passage of the bill, I realised that I was the only committee member who was on the then committee which actually scrutinised uh, the, the then census uh, order uh, for the 2011 census. But so it did strike me at regarding how much society has actually changed over the course of the, the last 10 years. Society is more open and more tolerant, but there is still a long, long way to go. And this bill being brought forward along, uh, along to allow this census to actually deal with today's society and beyond is therefore very, very important. Now, Ross Greer touched upon uh, the, the aspect of the, uh, of the census and also asking 
the question uh, on a voluntary basis regarding the transgender status. And he also then touched upon the, the issue regarding the, the NHS and the NHS using, uh, using their own data. Um, the fact that certainly from the, the, the policy memorandum, section 17 of the policy memorandum actually touches upon also the, the issue of the lack of data regarding transgender. Uh, and this is where I can understand why the NHS will actually use their own data, because first of all, a, that data isn't there really at the moment, but secondly, when uh, this census uh, uh, takes place in 2021, uh, that will be the, the data at that particular period of time. And also in the 10 years after that, obviously things will change hugely as well. So I, I generally can understand why the NHS will have to go and use their own data. Uh, during the, the stage one debate on the 28th of February, I quoted paragraphs 11 and 75 from our committee report. And paragraph 11 was stated, the committee agrees that there has been considerable social change with regard to issues concerning sexual orientation since 2011. And paragraph 75 of the report contained, uh, well, I actually contained a quote from the cabinet secretary, uh, and that, uh, where it stated, the cabinet secretary stated that the census does not lead public opinion. The census has to reflect society as it is just now and ask questions that maximise the response rate so that the data can be used. The statements were absolutely correct then, as, as they certainly are now, and they will be in the future going forward. Now, the bill before us recognises both the importance and the sensitivity of the new questions, and it's trying to mitigate the concerns about intrusion into to private life by placing the questions on that voluntary basis, as colleagues have stated. Now, the main policy aim of the bill is not to facilitate the asking of questions about transgender matters and sexual orientation, but to make answering those questions voluntary. And this uh, would uh, be in the same way that the religion question was placed on a voluntary basis by the Census Amendment Scotland Act in 2000. Now, the Census questions are otherwise compulsory. Now, presenting officer, uh, just to conclude, that I, I generally am pleased that this technical bill will pass through Parliament today uh, and that uh, we will have a census fit for 2021. Uh, that, that, that can certainly can be delivered uh, and also uh, when the people fill it out and the, the data then comes out uh, as a consequence of that, uh, that people can actually have trust and faith in it. But as other colleagues have indicated this afternoon, uh, there will be plenty of time to actually discuss the gender recognition issues. Now, clearly there are differing views, but I, I echo the calls from colleagues across the chamber today that, that in order to actually have these discussions uh, and to have them carried out, uh, in a, a professional manner. I genuinely actually ask for people to do it in a calm manner and also with respect, because generally there are people who will have differing views and it's important that all views actually are heard. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I call Tom Arthur to be followed by Polly McNeill. Thank you uh, very much, presiding officer. Um, listening to this debate so far, I, I think it would be easy just to speak for only 30 seconds or alternatively speak for 30 minutes given some of the issues that I've touched on. Um, but I would like to begin by thanking the uh, committee for their uh, work and their endeavours in getting to a stage where we can debate stage three without any amendments. Um, I also want to put on record my thanks to all the organisations who gave evidence to the committee and provided briefings ahead of this debate as well, which has helped to inform my understanding. Um, to some extent, th this bill's importance and significance is in inverse relation to its size. And that is a point that um, many members have touched on, including Jamie Green and um, Ross Greer, um, I think described it as being a very short and simple bill. But often with issues that are perhaps short and simple, they can find the fissures in our public discourse and expand them quite considerably. But I think actually in general principles of this bill, which to an extent this debate is a rehash of and what we had at, state, what, at stage one, I agree with entirely. And placing on a statu statutory footing the questions of sexual orientation and trans history as voluntary question, I think are very, very welcome. Um, I also uh, want to welcome the fact that this census in 2021 will be a predominantly digital say, um, census, but with provisions in place for people who are not um, able to participate digitally. Um, and it'll be interested in terms of the implications that has for the ex expediting the production of the data, because I am going to be fascinated to see the data that emerges out of this census, because this census coming up in 2021 comes at a, a very significant time, not just for Scotland, but for the world, because we are seeing um, in, in many quarters, I don't want to see a tension, but a 
very strong dialogue taking place between different generations. Generation Z, those born in 1996, um, are, are now coming of age. Millennials such as myself, born between 1980 and 1986, are not quite at the knacker's yard, but it sometimes feels like we're heading that way. Um, don't worry, I won't go on to the Generation Xers and the baby boomers of indeed the silent generation. Hi, James. Um, now, the reality is from this, the data from this has very significant and real-world implications in terms of shaping public policy. And as Tavish Scott said, we have a, 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 a task every decade in making sure that we get this census absolutely right. And I think the process um, with regards to this bill has been commendable in working forward. And I hope the process is characterised uh, or the tenor that has characterised the process of this bill moving through Parliament will inform the conversations and discussions we have um, in the next parliamentary year when we look at the cens census order. Um, I certainly do not envy uh, those charged with devising questions. It is an extremely complex issue because identity is an extremely, extremely complex issue. But while a census is an event, it is a cumulative intergenerational process. And I think one, in, in concluding, one remark I would like to make reflecting on the 2011 census, which um, included, and it was a very welcome inclusion of a question on carers. Within that census, 429,000 people identified as carers. But in a subsequent Scottish Health and Experience survey, 759,000 people identified as carers. Now, there was a number of complex reasons for that, and I think it's apropos to, to highlight that during Carers Week, but that's because not everyone who is a carer realises that they are a carer. So there's a constant need for work and guidance to help people to understand the questions that they're being asked and to understand its relevancy to their own lives, their own circumstances, and their own experiences. And I hope that we can continue to take a very um, moderate and considered approach um, as we progress through the process towards the census and considering the questions themselves later on in this parliamentary session. Thank you very much, Mr. Arthur. I call Polly McNeill to be followed by Annabel Ewing. Polly McNeill. I would like to join with other members in thanking the committee for their hard work in reaching this point, making it relatively straightforward for the rest of us, but I would like to associate uh, myself with the remarks by Tavi Scott and others about the importance of having a debate in this sphere with respect and dignity, which has to be applied universally. Allowing questions on the purpose of the bill, allowing questions on sexual orientation and prescribed aspects of gender identity is the purpose of the bill to do it on a voluntary basis. I think it's a big step, but it's an absolutely essential one. Essential that no one should be fined for not answering it. Um, and of course, as the Minister, Cabinet Secretary says, uh, followed by SSIs, there's always a catch, there's always SSIs. But the importance of the census as a tool in understanding... I certainly will. Had the member been listening to the debate, I noticed she was in conversation for the first um, certainly three quarters of an hour uh, with her colleague. But it's not just the case of any other SSI. The difference with the census bill is got a different procedure. And therefore, it's not just like any other procedures. When the final questions come, the role for the parliament and particularly the parliamentary committee is quite, quite, quite different than the regular SSI. Holly McNeill. Oh, well, that'll teach me. <laughs> um, but, um, oh, well, I apologise to the cabinet secretary. She thought I was being flippant. I wasn't meaning to be. Um, I, I do recognise the importance of the census as a tool in understanding the makeup of society. Uh, and we're fortunate that we've been running it for 100 years. Because all of Scotland's citizens should feel able to answer the census and at the same time, the purpose of the census in data collection is done to allow governments to adopt the appropriate policy and services to the population. In a helpful briefing, Stonewall outlined some of the important purposes of the bill to have authoritative data on lesbian and gay, bisexual and transgender people, assist public authorities to meet the statutory requirements changing over time and the planning of service provisions in advance of LGBT equality. Uh, that data can be used to build an evidence base and measuring progress on meetings. And I think it's important to note that we do also have to measure the progress when we have the data collection. 
We also lack this kind of information and we need it to decide how to shape the services for the LGBT community. We desperately need it and we desperately need it for trans people who face difficulties in their daily lives. In a recent case as an MSP, um, I took on the case of a transgender woman who was advised seven days before an employment tribunal that she would no longer get the legal representation that she was promised. I believe that there are deeply rooted issues in employment law for transgender people. Uh, it's a real experience for people and I think it's something that we could look at to give support in that regard. LGBT Scotland in a survey in 2017 uh, identified that 85% of LGBT people said that transphobia was an issue and 41% of young trans people had experienced a hate crime in the previous year. In the last debate, I did ask the minister, and I was listening then, uh, I, in the last debate I asked the minister if she could clarify the definition of household and if we could be sensitive to the fact that many LGBT young people uh, who maybe have not, are not comfortable with telling their family what their identity is, uh, just to be sure that we've dealt with that question correctly and I look forward to an answer um, on that. Thank you very much. I wrote Okay, the, the Cabinet Secretary can uh, perhaps add that to her concluding comments. Can I call Annabel Ewing, who's the last of our opening speakers before we move to closing speeches. Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to have been called to speak in this uh, debate uh, this afternoon on stage three of the Census Amendment Scotland Bill. And at the outset, I too would like to thank the committee clerks and Spice for all their hard work in connection with the bill. And as we have heard, it was not matters within the formal scope of the bill itself that were at issue, but rather wider issues regarding the wording of the mandatory sex question that will fall to be agreed in terms of secondary legislation to be brought forward, I understand, next year. And before turning to that issue, I think it is important to stress that there was consensus around the purpose of the bill. Specifically, all committee members supported introducing questions on a voluntary basis as to sexual orientation and trans status and history. The only issue that arose here was the perhaps rather confusing drafting in the original version of the bill, which risked conflating sex with gender identity. However, the Cabinet Secretary made it clear that it was never the intention behind the bill to conflate sex and gender identity, and indeed, as promised, came forward with amendments at stage two to rectify matters. The Cabinet Secretary also confirmed her support further to the committee's recommendation that individuals' privacy rights be respected when completing the form. Uh, and I'm pleased to note in this regard, and that perhaps helps Pauline McNeill and uh, 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 gives her some relief, that in fact National Records for Scotland is developing a system to allow uh, individuals to complete an individual form in private, a very, very important point. The next steps further to the bill we, will be for close engagement, as far as I understand it, on the wording of the voluntary questions with both the committee and wider stakeholders uh, involved and I look forward to that process. Finally, it would be perhaps remiss of me not to mention the wider uh, debate that was generated on the mandatory sex question, even though, as I say, it was not within the formal scope of the bill itself. Whilst the committee recognised these strongly held views on the matter, it nonetheless recommended that the mandatory sex question remained binary by a vote of six in favour to one against with two abstentions. I entirely support that recommendation, presiding officer. In this regard, evidence was received on the scientifically grounded theory of human sexual dimorphism, and we were reminded that sex is a protected characteristic under the Equality Act of 2010. It was also queried as to how any other approach could ensure that the census adhere to the highest statistical standards and provide longitudinal consistency. And as the convener of the committee has referred to, Professor Susan McVeigh, Chair of Quantitative Criminology at the University of Edinburgh has said uh, to the committee members recently in a letter, and I quote, uh, the conflation of sex and gender identity goes against existing inequalities legislation and risks the construction of inaccurate and corrupted data that are not fit for the purposes for which the census and other official data sources are required. Indeed, I think it would be important to reiterate the point that I made at a stage one about how National Records for Scotland would proceed if there was a non-binary question under the mandatory sex question heading. This was uh, an important point raised this afternoon by Claire Baker, but I think it gets to the crux of the matter. And so I will mention again that the head of census statistics at National Records for Scotland, Amy Wilson, said in evidence to the committee that National Records for Scotland would, and I quote, randomly assign people back into the male and female categories 
and uh, that it would, and I quote, still produce outputs on a male and female basis. So this indeed, presiding officer, begs the question as to what would be the point of including such a non-binary question in our national census, a route, incidentally, that the ONS in England and Wales has in fact recommended against taking. Presiding officer, this debate is, of course, for another day, but given the considerable amount of evidence received on the subject, I did feel it important to make mention of that issue uh, this afternoon. In conclusion, I would wish to stress my support for the Census Bill, and I look forward to voting for the Bill at Stage 3 this afternoon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Ms. Dewing. And we turn now to closing speeches. I call on Claire Baker to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Um, it's been an interesting debate, which has inspired conversations in the Chamber as well as speeches. And while it is the final piece of uh, legislation, in many ways it has been the opening conversation on future debates on gender identity and the census, on reform of the Gender Recognition Act and transgender rights. Although the debate has been wide-ranging, we should not lose sight of what the Bill is achieving. For the first time, the 2021 Census will collect information on a person's sexual orientation and transgender status and history, if they wish to answer these questions. The Census strives to be accessible, relevant and maintain integrity in the data. It is important that these questions are asked on a voluntary basis, and that's a position which is widely supported. I understand that work is ongoing to ensure individual respondents' confidentiality and be sensitive to their needs, and I would appreciate an update on this work. The census is important for worker public bodies in making key decisions about resource allocation, policy development, and how services are planned. By gathering this additional information, the needs of the LGBT community can be better served and understood, as Jamie Green highlighted in his opening speech. Returning to the issue of the sex question, it is interesting to consider the work of the ONS who are considering the same issue. They have concluded that there would be a risk to the data if data collected on sex if a third option were to be added to that question, although Ross Greer did set out his belief that this question should be included and gave the arguments for that position. But as we are agreeing today, voluntary questions will be added on transgender identity and the ONS think that they can meet the needs of this group. They are proposing that the sex question remains unchanged, as Annabel Ewing has just stated. It is interesting that, depending on testing, ONS propose a caveat in the sex question to explain that a gender question will follow later in the questionnaire. They have stated that this has been found to increase acceptability among the transgender and non-binary populations, and it will be interesting to hear whether, this, whether or not this is an option that has been explored in Scotland. It is concerning the elements of the debate around these issues has become toxic. This is a situation of misrepresentation and accusations. This presents a challenging environment for the Parliament to consider the reforms to the Gender Recognition Act, which is a parallel issue to this debate, and one which has added an intensity to the discussion of a census bill that was perhaps not anticipated. Murray Blackburn Mackenzie's briefing sets out concerns over what they describe as losing sight of women's interests. And these were issues that were raised by Joe McAlpine this afternoon. There are concerns that the protected characteristic of sex is being diminished, even ignored. These points must not be dismissed. They need to be addressed. We must not close down debate. An open debate has to take place without fear or threat to anyone. I've heard comments this afternoon that society is changing. But to ensure Scotland is a safe, welcoming, respectful country for everyone, we need to progress with understanding and work to achieve a degree of consensus. Reform of the GRA is necessary, and the government, though I expect it's, it's not respect, it's not the direct responsibility of today's cabinet secretary. The government does need to be clear about their intentions over this and bring the debate to parliamentary scrutiny. The debate which is dominating public discourse often does not recognise other issues affecting LGBT people. The LGBT population is subject to multiple disadvantages in the workplace, in education and in Civic Scotland. We know that prejudice exists, exists towards the LGBT community and that physical and verbal assault is all too common. Access to appropriate health services is not always easy and this is compounded by Scotland's geography. As Polly McNeill highlighted, LGBT Youth Scotland report that 84% of young people who are LGBT and 96% of trans young people feel that they have experienced a mental health problem. LGBT people can face isolation from their families and communities. I fully recognise the concerns that have been expressed around what changes to the GRA will mean for women and girls and what this means in terms of women's rights. But we must also recognise that the LGBT communities are often vulnerable and open to exploitation and assault themselves. 
We need to charter a path through this debate in a sensitive and understanding manner which recognises and addresses the concerns of everyone about the impact of these proposed changes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be able to close for the Scottish Conservatives on today's Stage 3 debate on the Census Amendment Scotland Bill. It has been a very interesting to hear the contributions from across the chamber this afternoon. And as a committee member myself, uh, I very much welcome the progress and thank all those who have contributed and given evidence and also supported and, and given us briefings during this whole process. It is quite obvious there's a real depth of feeling on this issue. This is a short but very important bill and will ensure that the information collected for future census will help us better understand the modern Scotland and the people who live here. And that was outlined by Jamie Green earlier in his contribution. But we've had some very good and some balanced contributions from across the chamber this afternoon, from Tavish Scott, from Ross Greer, Claire Baker, and from Joan McAlpine. As has been discussed, the Equalities Act requires public sector organisations to consider the needs of groups with protected characteristics, such as when they are delivering services in their own environment and for employment practices. In particular, uh, we take regard to the need to ensure that individuals are not discriminated, harassed, victimised, uh, and the equality uh, and the opportunity between different groups to ensure that they foster good relations between these is vitally important. And that was also uh, itemised uh, by my colleague, Annie Wells. Uh, and we've had, as we've already heard, uh, Presiding Officer, some very strong views uh, from organisations such as Stonewall and others when their briefings about what that should do and how that should be informed in in our debate and discussion. In order to perform the duties of public sector, bodies require reliable data on protected characteristics. These remain significant gaps, and we've seen that in the data uh, regarding sexual orientation and gender identity. And in particular, the National Records of Scotland say that there is not currently reliable data uh, that is sourced that the size and the locality of the trans community living within Scotland. This is one of the major reasons for requiring an update in the census legislation and I believe that this bill will help better allow public sector organisations to fulfil their equality duties. It is also worth noting that similar information uh, has been done south of the border. The UK government, in the form of a white paper and the Office of National Statistics, both recommend that the English and Wales uh, in 2021 census should include questions on both sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, and that, like us, uh, that would be on a voluntary basis. From our own presentations on the Scotland Conservatives ourselves, we wanted to ensure that there was guidance and it was outlined and clearly explained the difference between sex and gender identity. These are often conflated and also in the questions on gender and sexual orientation are voluntary and there are no penalties for those who choose not to answer them. It is welcome uh, that the wording in the questions will be tested, uh, there'll be consultation and there'll be engagement with National Records of Scotland and other stakeholders. However, we were still keen to ensure that a duty was placed on Scottish ministers to review the success or otherwise of the proposed questions of sexual orientation and gender identity. And it is vitally important uh, that during that part takes place when the census. Uh, at, that, at the second stage of the reading, Jamie Green MSP put forward amendments uh, on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives to seek to address some of these issues. Uh, and following discussion with the Cabinet Secretary, uh, she supported and indicated that these amendments uh, could be brought forward and that, that, that there was little requirement for us to do that. Uh, and uh, we, we felt that was appropriate uh, and we actually withdrew the amendments. As we already have heard in the debate, the proposals have cross-party support and it has been great to see what we've said here today in this chamber because it's good for this parliament to have this kind of discussion but it's also good for Scotland to have this kind of discussion uh, presiding officer. The changes brought about by the bill will also have the backing of organisations outside Holyrood and we've had briefings from many of these organisations telling us exactly what they felt and what they thought we should be doing as a parliament to support the communities outside this parliament. Uh, indicated also from the Law Society, they were very happy and welcome that there was clarity about the question and the voluntary basis of that. So in conclusion, presiding officer, we are supportive of the bill to include questions on gender identity and sexual orientation to future censuses and a voluntary basis. And we are content uh, with the assurances that have been given 
because this will have a massive impact on the review of us going forward. So we are supportive of the bill. We, are, we believe that it is good for Scotland and the bill sets out exactly what is required. So we look forward to seeing what progress will be taken once this passes today. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop to wind up and conclude our debate this evening. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm again grateful to my parliamentary colleagues here today for another useful debate on these sensitive matters. I am pleased that stakeholders, the committee and Parliament have supported the key principles of the Census Bill uh, throughout the bill process. And it's right that these questions should be voluntary. It is also critical that all census respondents clearly know that voluntary means just that and that there will be no penalty for not answering these questions. And I've made it um, very clear from the beginning of this process that the purpose, the singular purpose of the bill is to remove criminal penalty from these questions and make them voluntary rather than the standard compulsory. Work is in hand by National Records of Scotland to ensure that this is communicated, which includes embedding the words, this question is voluntary, into the text of the new questions. This is so that the census respondents are not required to cross-refer to separate instructions to find this information out. And this is what was done with the religion question in the 2011 census. But also after discussion at stage two, um, the Register General has also confirmed that he will make this clear in the covering message on the front of the census questionnaire, as well in, as in the supporting guidance. And I'm confident that the messaging of voluntary will be very clear. Stakeholders have been involved throughout the planning for 2021 to ensure National Records of Scotland will be asking the right questions in the right way. Uh, National Records of Scotland carried out a public consultation uh, between 2015 and January 2016 in order to understand what information users needed from the census in 2021 and that's worth stressing the purpose of the census primarily is to identify what needs there are and to ensure those needs can be met and i think there's been a number of good contributions um, about why we need to have more information in particular about sexual orientation and transgender issues uh, and i think that was a point made by a number of the contributors uh, claire baker and jamie green and indeed others and that's the critical point of the census so that work uh, included working directly with a wide a range of stakeholders, which involved thousands of people in Scotland uh, from across society. The census bill process has highlighted that we must continue to ensure the identity of all individuals and groups that have an interest in census matters uh, and ensure that the new relationships are developed between them and the National Records of Scotland. Uh, it's also critical that stakeholders continue to be kept informed and where possible are able to influence plan uh, up until Census Day. Uh, and Ter Polly McNeill raised the issue of households. I did actually reply to her after stage one with information, but I will also copy to her the information that we gave to the committee, particularly about the sensitivities about households and particularly for individuals, um, perhaps those that uh, have not come out in relation to the rest of their families, but want to obviously take part in the census and how that will be done to respect confidentiality and, and be discreet. The Census Bill has been the first direct involvement of uh, in of uh, Scotland's 2021 census for the Scottish Parliament and it's clearly stimulated debate and interest in the census as we now move forward to the subordinate legislation process. We have the critical requirements of a census order and census regulations to be put in force before we can have a census in 2021. And that's going to involve extensive work by the Parliamentary Committee. And in advance, I, I work, you know, appreciate the work they've put in to date, but there's obviously a considerable amount of work uh, to go forward in relation to those orders and regulations. Work has already been progressed with the Culture, Tourism, uh, Europe and External Affairs Committee to ensure that they all have the necessary information uh, this year to thoroughly uh, and appropriately consider these matters. Passing the Census Bill will mean we can ask questions on sexual orientation and transgender status and history on a voluntary basis. But Parliament still has to agree that these questions will in fact be asked in the 2021 Census. Although I detect from the contributions from today, there is a willingness and appreciation that that should be the case. There are other questions and other census matters that will be considered by the committee and wider parliament as we progress through the process. The questions are clearly a critical part of census, but National Records of Scotland is currently planning the whole operation for a successful digital census in 2021. Presiding officer, there is only 648 days to go until census day. The responsibility and influence of Parliament does not end at Census Day, though. I mentioned in my opening address the plans of National Records of Scotland to process 
and output census data. The Registrar General will also be preparing reports on the census returns and laying these before the Scottish Parliament at the appropriate time after the census. Now, that's obviously data content, but also in terms of operation. In addition to these specific reports, the Registrar General will also be preparing a comprehensive report on the overall census operation. This will include an evaluation of the new questions being asked in 2021, including the voluntary ones in sexual orientation and transgender status and history. This report will also be brought to Parliament for consideration. So as you can see, National Records of Scotland have a, a thorough uh, through process to, in place to collect, process and output census day but also to ensure appropriate consideration and evaluation of these matters. Now, one of the things that uh, has been raised in the committee report, but also in contributions from Ross Greer and Claire Baker, is the question is, will the sex question be on the basis of live sex? That is not the purpose of this bill. And indeed, I think I agree with Jamie Green and his approach, that his focus and remarks were specifically about the content of the bill, but reflecting that actually the process for considering the, the actual wording of that question will come next as part of the process. Uh, I want to make my point here. I, I have already communicated to the committee that I think it's really important that people have confidence in using the census data, but also are confident in completing uh, the data honestly. And I think that's one of the issues in terms of that wording. But I would want to stress, and this is the point I made to Paul McNeill, it will be for the committee to consider on the basis of all evidence provided and the further testing, which is currently also taking place, and the consultation with stakeholders. It's only when we've done that we'll be able to determine what that question will be. And that's what's quite different about this process compared to other processes. In presenting the final census order, I need to know that there will be agreement on that final census order in its completeness. And that is why NRS need to work very, very closely with the committee to share the evidence of what works, look at comparisons with other countries, including the rest of the UK, but also Australia, Canada, other places where this has taken place. And that is, I think, the right way to go. So I cannot definitively give Ross Greer that answer or indeed give anybody else that answer because that is the collaborative, cooperative process that is involved in putting the census together. In concluding, I'd like to thank everyone again who have contributed throughout the process of the Census Bill and to this debate today. The 2021 Census will be our first predominantly digital one, but for it to be successful, we must ensure that we are asking the right questions in the most appropriate way. Finally, I'd like to repeat my thanks to all those who gave evidence to help improve the bill during its parliamentary process, and particularly to our colleagues in the National Records of Scotland and the Bill team, and I commend the motion in my name. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And that concludes our debate on the Census Amendment Scotland Bill. The next item is consideration of Business Motion 17671 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Officer. Thank you very much. And no one has asked to speak against that motion. The question, therefore, is that this motion 17671 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. I would just draw members' attention that we have provisionally put in a seven o'clock decision time on Tuesday and Wednesday next week. I, you've just voted for it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> now the next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 17672 and approval of an SSI. Could I call on Graeme Day on behalf of the Bureau to move this motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. So we turn to decision time. The first question is that motion 17645 in the name of Fiona Hislop on the Census Amendment Scotland Bill be agreed. And this is a bill members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 17645 in the name of Fiona Hislop is yes, 115. There were no votes against, there were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed and the Census Amendment Scotland Bill is passed.
question is that motion 17672 in the name of Graham D on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to members' business in the name of Joanne Lamont on new report calls for more housing co-ops we'll, in Scotland. But we'll just take a few moments for Minister, the members and members of the public gallery also to change seats. We'll just take a few moments pause.